My name is Ulrike Passe, and I'm a faculty here in architecture, and I have the pleasure of welcoming you uh, to the College of Design in place of the Dean, Luis Rico Gutierrez, who had to leave us for a short charrette somewhere else in the Midwest. And I'm here because I was involved together with Peter Surweste and Patience Luis to organize the visit of our friends from Lima and now London, uh, Christina Dreyfus and Jose Sepero. And there's a little story behind all of this because we had a long-standing relationship with IntuiLab and Christina at the, her university in Lima before COVID. And that started, now I know the story for real, <laughs> with Iowa State students in Chicago meeting at a bar or in a hostel, at the bar of the hostel with Lima students. And I don't know, those of you who were here a long time, you probably remember the graduate student Shamir from Puerto Rico, who now lives in New York. And he took them all out for a drink. <laughs> and that's how it happened, because Shamir and Claire Cardinal Pett, who was my colleague at the time, talked about this event when they came back and Claire started a studio, Studio Andino in Lima, short story of a long development. And for four or five years, 2012, 14, 15, 16, 17, Claire Cardinal Pett, who's now retired, took an option studio with interdisciplinary students to Lima to collaborate with Intuila, building whole structures from here in spring break in Lima. And that's where they actually met with Christina Dreyfus and Jose Sepero, who was then a student of Christina's at UPC, right? University Polytechnic of Lima. No, University of Applied Sciences, exactly, UPC. And so I had the pleasure because I was curious in 2017 to actually see what they were doing to just tag along in the spring for the Lima trip. And I, saw, and I volunteered one day to actually work with these folks and students from Lima and the Iowa State students to build a park and a shading structure in the Churillos, which is above the ocean. So Long, fast forward, last fall I got, had the pleasure of receiving a travel grant to Chile, which as you know is south of Peru. And dear Dean Luis Rico Gutierrez got wind of that and said, you know I've done this before, can't you stop on the way back in Lima and see if our friends are still interested in starting that collaboration with us? And I said, well, are you going to pay me to stop in Lima? <laughs> sure. And there I was. In December 2022, I reconnected with Christina, and I reconnected with Jose, and I learned how incredible the work developed from 2017 to now, during the pandemic, all the projects in Tui Lab, which is Chechua, and I'm sure Jose is going to say, tell us what that means, has done with international support and internal Peruvian support over the last five years. And so we were really happy that we got both of them together here. Christina Dreyfus in the last few months also became Dean of the College of Art and Architecture at the Universita Privada del Norte, which is half of North Peru. And Jose is now a master's student at University College London at the Bartlett and came to us two days ago from London, having navigated all the first few weeks at the Bartlett and the, inter inter uni the community development the unit, DPU at the Bartlett. So Christina has a PhD from Sapienza and Jose is getting his master's from Bartlett. We are really happy because we are working down at the King Pavilion on a new project they brought with them in Lobitos, which is on the coast in northern Peru. Quite a few, most of the students are here. 
They're working downstairs. Check their work out. On Monday, there will be an exhibition in Hansen. Talk to them, give them feedback, talk to Christina and Jose, because now they're going to share with us their work. And thank you, Peter, and the public program of architecture to make this happen. Thanks to the dean, the dean's office, all the support we got to get them here. And please share a warm Iowa welcome to our friends from Lima. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ulrike, and thank you all for being here. Um, thank you to Luis, too, even though he's not here. Uh, I consider him a personal friend, and I think he's... You have a very cool dean, and now that I get to be dean, I am very aware of how difficult that is. So, you know, if you see Luis on the hallways, hug him. You know, it's weird, but do that. And also, he's Mexican, so he won't mind. Go and hug him. He's a great guy. And, you know, the environment here at ISU is a great environment to study architecture. It's diverse. And your faculty is, you know, they are game for everything. So if you have weird ideas, go talk to them and propose them. Because I don't think, and I've been in many schools, I don't think I've seen any other school in which, you know, best idea wins and stuff happens which also leads to a very diverse student population, and that's, you know, perfect. So um, we've been discussing a lot what we wanted to share with you guys, and one of the things we always talk about is that, okay, we are going to do something in Peru, we're going to talk about Peru, and we're going to talk about, well, informal environments, which is more or less my area of study. And why is that important for architecture or design students at Iowa State University up north of North America or the United States of America? So why are we uh, here and why is this, I think, important for you guys? So I'm going to get there in a moment. I'm just going to po propose the question so I get you guys interested in what I'm going to say. So that's South America, right? And a couple of you guys around here are from the area, which is great. And this is, uh, do you guys see my thing? I don't think you see my thing. Well, anyway, the Peru is over there. Uh, we are, the, the guys involved in the charrette are working on the northern part of Peru, almost where Ecuador is. And that's a completely different context in every possible scenario you can imagine. People do different things. Uh, our weather is completely different. Our, the way our population is organized is completely different. But at the end, turns out we might share a lot of common ways of relating with space and common ways of thinking about space. And I think that's where the interesting part comes. So I am not going to talk about Lobitos, which is the area we're working on. I'm going to talk about Lima and I'm going to talk about informality and why that is important for us architects or designers. So Lima is right in the middle of the coastline in Peru. It's one of the few capitals of the world that faces the ocean, and that's the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this uh, photo is taken from Chorrillos, which is an area in which we've been working plenty of times, and Ulrike got to go there a couple of times, and I'm going to show a couple of pictures of that in a moment. But um, I'm going to tell you about the story of Lima, which is the story of many cities in the world, but also many cities mainly in the global south. So Lima was... It's a very old city. It is about two, maybe even three millennia old. But uh, in the 16th century, uh, Spaniards came. We got conquered by Spaniards, I suppose. And they kind of gave Lima a date of birth, which is dramatically outdated because it's a millenary city. But let's say 90, I'm sorry, 1535 which is where, when we started talking about a city in more or less modern terms. So the city was uh, made of more or less these three spots. The one on the far left is Callao, which is actually not part of Lima, is the, 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 the port, the harbor. The central spot is Central Lima, and then to the south they started making um, new neighborhoods uh, facing the ocean, that's Chorrillos. So this is 1940, okay? Some of your grandparents were alive back then, so to get some context. And then, between that and 1959, that's how Lima grew. And all of that growth, or I don't know, 90% of that growth, is 
due to informal settlements. So what happened? This happened in several parts of the world. A lot of the rural population came to the cities, attracted by new industries, attracted by new job possibilities. So they come to this, they came to the city, and of course the city was in no way equipped to host what we now know were thousands and thousands of people. You know, you can see the almost last thing is the population of Lima, who was increasing dramatically. So this is the 50s. And then we're jumping to the 70s, and then to the 80s, and this is 1998. So this is terribly outdated, because now it is much bigger. Only I ran out of cool graphics to show you, but you can imagine, it gets bigger and bigger. So what was first, uh, what were first, I'm sorry, uh, informal settlements and very precarious like huts made of hay or made of wood became part of the city. And now you can drive through Lima, especially through the darker marks of that plan, and it looks like a very developed regular city like the ones you have around here. Because informality is not a permanent stage, it's just a starting point. That's one of the things I would like you to remember. So what was happening in architectural terms while this was happening in urban terms? So the state was proposing these kind of solutions, right? Modernism at its best. Let's do some social housing and let's do them everywhere. Sounds nice. Only they didn't have the money to do them everywhere. That was impossible. So they did a couple of these projects. They're quite nice. They're you know, still being used, but they were absolutely not enough for the thousands and thousands of you know, families that were pouring into the city. So let's look at the numbers again. 1956, a little bit over 100,000 inhabitants. 1998, over 2 million. Now, we have over 8 million. So, so this is not enough, right? So what happens? This happens. People would come people would get organized in groups. Sometimes these groups were organized according to the, uh, where people were coming from. You know, people coming from Ayacucho would get together and establish a settlement. People were coming to, from, I don't know, Pasco would do the same thing. And that's the origins of the informal city back in the 40s and 50s. And incidentally, this picture was taken by Jose Matos Mar, who was a researcher, sociologist, slash anthropologist, who took part in these land occupations in order to better understand them. So he actually carried the structure on his back and you know, went there with the people to understand how this thing was happening. So let's talk about informality, because all of this sounds like something that happens over there. So that's where I'm going to argue that. It's not exactly like that. So first of all, let's describe illegal, which is not the same. So, Illegal is something that violate, violates existing codes. There is a rule, and we're going to do exactly what the rule is telling us not to do. Okay, you shouldn't steal. Well, I'm going to go ahead and steal something. That's illegal and that's bad, you know, we're supposed to. Informal is not really that. It's activities that might or not might be income generating that are not regulated by the state or by social environments or, you know, so you can have a version of this activity that is regulated, and you can have your informal activity which is not regulated. Let's say um, Girl Scouts cookies. You know Girl Scouts, they go and sell cookies that I think have drug on them because they are very addictive. I don't know what's into them. I don't want to go there. That's formal, right? You expect Girl Scouts to go and sell you cookies. You go there and you buy them, by the box. What about, what if any of you guys start selling cookies? You come here with your big Tupperware and you start selling cookies to your mates. We are all sleep deprived, we are all badly nourished, so we start buying those cookies. Is that illegal? It's called a bake sale. It's called a bake sale, right? Are you paying taxes for your bake sale? No, do you follow any sanitary rules? <laughs> I hope so. Uh, do you have a permit for selling your cookies? 
No. Are you going to jail because you're selling those cookies? No. Let's hope not, at least. I mean, I don't know how the rules in the United States are at the moment, but as far as I know, you're not going to jail. It's an informal activity, right? Uh, is that activity generating income? Probably. Are you going to get rich on your cookies? Probably not. So what is an informal economy? And this, not, this, doesn't, this doesn't come from me. It comes from the UN, so they are kind of experts in the matter. First of all, informal situations are usually based on small-scale units, small things that happen. You're not going to bring 2 million cookies like the Girl Scouts do. You're going to bring 20 or 50 or maybe 100. Few capital and or skills required. You don't need to invest a lot of money for your cookies. You're going to use what you have, or maybe you're going to borrow a couple of hundred dollars and you're going to do that. And you don't need to be, you know, the winner of MasterChef to go and bake your cookies. You're just going to go with your old grandma's recipe and, you know. And usually informal solutions are learned from the environment in an informal way, meaning there is not necessarily schools involved. There is not necessarily, you know, a teacher or a academic structure involved. So where did you guys learn to bake cookies? Well, my grandmother told me, or maybe I saw it on a YouTube video, which is what you guys do nowadays. Um, usually, informal situations have a flexible internal organization. And if there is something like a hierarchy, it might be challenged, it might be informal, it might be very, very flexible. And usually, it involves informal relationships with clients, with suppliers, with the authority. So you come with your cookies, you don't want to have problems with the dean, so you go and you offer him a couple of cookies for free. And you're free to keep selling your cookies. It's a good thing Luis is not here because he would have shut me up by now. So, and then, and here is the key, informal solutions are easy to adapt. When some informal practice is going on, because its origins were so flexible and so as answers to very specific problems, they tend to adapt quite easily. And that is the first lesson I would like you guys to, you know, catch. Because architecture is by definition very slow. How long would it take to build this auditorium? How long would it take to design this auditorium? How long would it take for people to agree on building an auditorium to begin with? So the first lesson informality teaches us is adaptation. But then it also comes along with another very funny word, flexibility. Because flexibility is what makes us adapt, is what helps us in this adaptation process. And it, it is what helps us to be ready for uh, things that are going to change. Like the environment, for example. So this is becoming relevant these days that we don't know what to do with the water because it all became crazy, it's becoming crazy, you know? So, and then when you are more or less aware of informal processes of, or informal, of informal ways, I'm sorry, to make things, you kinda spot opportunities. You kinda know what to do. Because, and this is not necessarily a good thing, actually I think it's a bad thing. When there is a system that is not effectively providing for you, you gotta learn to provide for yourself. So when you're arriving to the city and there is not enough housing and you gotta grab your land and you gotta do your house because otherwise you don't have anywhere to live and you get away with that, you learn that that is a way of living. So this kinda grows and grows and grows and that is not necessarily good. So what kind of spotting opportunities? Like this. That's a small house in the very outskirts of the city, outskirts of the city towards east. And okay, it's a very sunny area, so they have this kind of roof shadowing structure, which at night can, you know, close and you have like a door for your small store or like a shadow for people to sit on those small steps and, you know, have something to, to drink. So this is very small scale. But what happens when this becomes a habit? So then informality takes over the city. 
or in this case takes over a street. What's happening here, this is a market. The, the, the light blue structure on the right side, it's, you know, the regular market in which you go and you have like, you know, the barrows and whatnot. But then it kind of like went out and took over the street. It does, that doesn't exist anymore. You know, the, the, the city council kind of relocated them or something. But now it's becoming problematic because now we have a conflict between informal and formal structures. And then when this, this gets super, super big, we have a city that, that, that looks like this. And this is Lima, but you know, a lot of cities look like, look like this. So let's go to the city. What's the formal city? That's architecture as we learn it in school. You know, something, first of all, that is not supposed to move. I mean, this auditorium, I hope it's not supposed to move. It's built with permanent materials. It's supposed to last. It's static. It depends, I mean, the city, the formal city, depends on architecture for its representation. What does that mean? That while you're walking the city, you recognize landmarks, like that clock tower over somewhere, I don't know, you know, here in Iowa. Or like, you know, that bridge thing with the neon red lights. Uh, we drove here a couple of nights ago. It was 1 a.m. and we were driving, Jose and I, and then we saw this red thing that is more or less new. We hadn't seen the last time. What's that? Okay, we got to Iowa State University. That's good. We're on the right path. So, you know, you recognize it. It has a representational value. And sometimes architecture becomes a spectacle. You know, like any city anywhere. What happens with informal city? First of all, it's not perceived through buildings, but through space. We were talking about, uh, in our project, and this is a bit for the guys that are taking the charrette, about ways in which people move. How do these kids get to the ocean? So it's not about this building and this building and this building. It's about the act of moving through the city. Because that city is kinetic, it's changing. It is actually moving with you. It's growing with you. It's changing with you. And it's a direct response to everyday needs. So the shape and the perception of that shape is perceived, is defined by how we use, how we occupy the city. And now we get to talk about spontaneous urbanism and these logics that emerge from particular situations that emerge from human life, from, you know, the human experience. And it looks like this. Or like, you know, any other picture you can see of these spontaneous neighborhoods. So some of the uses are inconceivable in the, form, in the formal city. The formal city does not host these kind of uses. And then the limits that we are used to see in the formal city, like this is my Land. This is my yard. Don't, don't, don't step on it. They are much more flexible in the informal city. Perhaps because some of the occupation was not really legal to begin with, but also because in that flexibility of spaces and limits, we get opportunities for activities, such as this one. Uh, this lady sells, uh, I, don't, I always forget the name of the bird, you know, these small eggs that you can eat. Uh, huh? quail. quail, yeah, codorniz, right? Okay, quail eggs. And so she has this kind of small card in which, I don't know if you get to see it, but there's like a pot behind the, the, the eggs because she boils them there and you can go, uh, go and buy a bag full of eggs and eat them on your way to work. I mean, it's kind of crazy, but these ladies are everywhere and this card, this is for my uh, industrial design fellows. Uh, this is an industrial design product designed by some anonymous person who just wanted a place to get their eggs moving. So this is a thing that can move around. But what about this? This is a moving restaurant. And these things happen when some sort of procession of, or parade, mostly religious, happen in the city. So, you know, the, the saint goes, and the, pray, the guys who pray go after the saint, and then after that comes the moving restaurants. So they stop, they eat, and then they kind of fold everything and keep on walking. So the city moves. Restaurant moves, uh, shops move, people move. And incidentally, this is not exactly legal, and there is a cop over there, like, he doesn't care. I mean, he's just coexisting with the activities. So, um, moving this to architecture, um, architecture here is an ongoing process of adaptation. 
And this is, uh, I think, what can be also important about informal architecture. We used to have this idea of, you know, I'm going to buy a house with my husband and my kids, and we're going to live there forever, right? Because we're a happy family, and the house is a house forever. Is that so? Never. First of all, I, don't, I can't afford a house, but that's another story. Uh, but families change, right? When I moved out, I was living alone. And then we needed some space because I got this guy moving with me. Actually, it was the other way around. Anyway, and then we got children. So we needed somewhere to put those children. And then these children are like growing alarmingly fast, I have to say. So they, need, they, they are asking for one room for each one of them. I mean, what's that? Are we like, what, rich or something? So and then they're going to keep on growing and keep on getting smelly. And once I host all that thing, they are going to move away. So what about the house that's going to last forever? Is that even useful? I mean, do we need that? So we need a house that expands, that is super well ventilated, and that then shrinks. So we need architecture that moves that grows and shrinks as we, as people, uh, ask it for that. So I, you're not, oh. So this, that is happening in the informal city, right? Something weird is, um, it's okay. It's okay. So this, that is happening because, you know, uh, families are in charge of building their own dwellings, and these dwellings grow in time, and I'm going to go a little bit faster through this, but, you know, this is a sol solution to a very precarious social and economical condition. And this has a way of transforming the cities, of course. So with what started like this, and this is a picture from the 50s, and then becomes this. This is a much more recent picture. And then this, and houses start growing as families grow. And they start getting better. And sometimes they start getting even prettier. And then kids move out, so they rent out the flats that were first houses of, you know, the children and that kind of thing. So this is the most extreme way in which informality can happen. But, but still, the lessons are there, and I think that us, uh, we as architects should try to find those lessons and to try to learn from this. So just to uh, wrap it up a bit, what happens when we as formally trained architects try to meet an informal environment and try to work on solutions for informal environments. So formal meets informal or try to meet informal. First of all, uh, there's a mistake on that thing. There is no clear definition between formal and informal. It's not like we are formal and one day we kind of go into informality land and see what's happening <coughs> over there. So those it's kind of a blur limit between one type of action and another one. But this leads to, to social environmental approaches. So first of all, what can we do as architects? Small scale interventions. You know, some decades ago, urban design was telling us to think big, to draw huge lines into huge pieces of paper and in, invent new cities. This is asking us to do exactly the opposite to think about small-scale interventions, urban acupuncture, to be participative, to really engage, to really listen, to really learn from what we are going to do. Which also, of course, implies lots of research. So research like the one who, uh, the, the research that was taken by Favela Bairro in Rio de Janeiro, in which they would kind of map what there was before starting to think about, um, uh, this is another one that's happening up north uh, in Peru, in um, Piedritas. It's more or less near Talara, more or less near intervention area, by the way, guys. So this is <clears throat> a collaboration between local population, a couple of architects, Elizabeth Llanos and Carlos Restrepo. And she did this school with a lot of collaboration from children and local population. And they try to, you know, use local solutions for ventilation and... It's a nice project. It still exists, fortunately, and it still works, which is not always the case. Um, so this happens when we as architects start listening and start learning from what the environment has to offer. 
I am not saying we have the solution. These are just a couple of pictures of the things we've been doing with ISU students, especially with IntuiLab. And this is intervention in Chorrillos. Actually, this is one of the ISU students. And I am forbidden to show you this picture because it violates like 20 regulations. So let's pretend. You know the guy? I don't know who he is. I've never seen it. I don't remember anything. <laughs> so the, what we did back then was, uh, was this structure, which became a gathering space. Uh, you know, and this is all, or this pretends to be low cost, high impact, and especially um, solutions based on reading what's going on and trying to uh, match the existing narrative and trying to, you know, get together with what, with the community in terms of hopes, desires, and dynamics. So what can you learn from the informal city? Adaptation, small scale solutions, a lot of imagination. This is, uh, what's the name of the guys who like uh, repair your shoes when they get broken? Well, I think, okay, yeah. You throw them away nowadays, but you know, back in the day, no, this is what happens, you, gotta, you get them fixed. And he kind of gets his workshop in the middle of the street. Or you know, community space outside a bodega in Lima, or gardens, even in a city that lacks water, so this means water recycling and that kind of thing. So I'm going to borrow a quote by uh, Guattari, which I think kind of wraps it up. In a context in which the relation between capital and human activity is repeatedly renegotiated, let us hope that ecological, feminist, anti-racist, and anti-everything else activity will focus more centrally on new modes of production of subjectivity, which is modes of knowledge, culture, sensitivity, and sociability. The future foundations of new productive assemblages whose sources lie in incorporeal systems of value. So how is that we as architects working with corporeal stuff, with physical stuff, with real materials, are we going to host all these incorporeal systems of value? And that's that. Thank you very much. So, oh, I'm sorry. I don't know what they. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, pero es porque siempre ah. estás la vida super alta. Te he escuchado tres mil veces y siempre es chévere. No, gracias. ¿Do you yeah. hear me? Yeah. Have you heard that I said Cristina I should have been first? <laughs> she lives like the La Valla Alta, we say in, in Spanish. Now you hear me? It's better? Yeah? Okay, so it's an honor to be here. Uh, this is my fifth time, I think, in Iowa, and it's still um, like beautiful to see new people, old friends also, um, and seeing that the topics we try to address are still um, important for, for this school. Um, 
It's an honor also to be after Christina because she was uh, my teacher back then. Um, once she graded me three out of 20, but it was because I deserved it and it worked. I mean, I'm here. <laughs> but um, the things we have done within Twilab are more or less um, like the practical application of the things that Christina said. And I was really lucky that she used some of our samples of the projects we have, we have done to figure out which are the implications of working in the, in the informal city or uh, within an informal structure. So after some years of, of uh, trying to, to do this on a practical way, um, not knowing an, a lot of things and failing a lot of times, um, we discovered this uh, concept about urban landscapes of care. And I wanna sh uh, talk to you about what's the relationship between care and, and design as an approach to collectively build the places uh, we live in. So I'm, in, I'm Jose, uh, I'm associate of Intuilab, which is an organization uh, where we work in public spaces and in their formal city that was firstly founded because of the collaboration with the Iowa State University. So to that extent, the, I the ISU is important for us. Uh, we are Jose, Hannah, and Juan Pablo. We are now the, the associates of, of Intuilab. Intuilab has a long story of different people who have been collaborating with the organization. And we have worked uh, in participatory processes, uh, building also uh, urban interventions, and working also with local governments uh, to use like the, the public space as a tool uh, and, and platforms for, for building better citizenship. But uh, the, the main objective of, of Intuilab is trying to link the academia with the city through experiential, experiential learning. So in that way, the work we have done with ISU students and, and other students over the world um, have has taught us that it's possible to link uh, the academia and to put um, students into real life situations to challenge um, what they have been, been learning. So I'm not, not gonna explain a lot of Lima because uh, Christina has already done that, but I wanna show you uh, some of the contrast uh, that we have in, in this particular city. We have uh, a seashore uh, that you can look over there. It's like a park over the sea. We have some informal settlements, but we have also a really big uh, historical center that it's um, humanity, human heritage by the, by the UNESCO. And some sort of activities or informal um, manifestations uh, related to what Christina said. So it's like more of what um, Christina has, has talked uh, about. But we have a crisis of, of um, public spaces in, in Lima. So the world, uh, you, you have heard about this, the World Health Organization recommends nine uh, square meters per person. In Lima we have um, lower than three, I think. Um, in LATAM only, in LATAM Latin America, only 1.5% of the urban areas are dedicated to, to public spaces. And well, it's lower than one. Uh, the data was wrong in my brain. So we have public spaces like this with a lot of concrete, but no shading and no relationship to nature. So we're pretty much destroying what um, makes great uh, a public space. And when we have public spaces, we close them. And we limit the access to them. So 
this puts like a challenging situation for us. Can, you, you can see the people can barely walk around there, okay? So that has also consequences. If you don't have public spaces, people don't gather, so they start to not recognize in them, themselves. So conflicts start to raise. And the society in Lima, I think all over the world, but in Lima, it's really conflictive, especially nowadays, in terms of, of politics, but also in terms of culture and, and cultural background, I would say. And then you have things like this, where inside there's a lot of communication, a lot of um, possibilities and opportunities for children to thrive and have access to, let's say, good educations. But outside, and this is the same, uh, the same place, you have places like this that don't give any opportunities for children. So if we think about how we are caring for children, we are caring for them in terms of not giving them the opportunities or the places or, or, or the assets to thrive in the city. So when a kid needs to go to school, they will go on a bus or on a combi, which is a small bus, a minivan, really informal, by the way, um, to go to the school so they don't have the experience of walking in the city. And if they walk, they see something like this. So caring structures are not so well defined <clears throat> in Lima. So we have some questions uh, to think about, and the ones who are on the charrette know that I like questions. Um, and the questions we want to tackle here is how we can reclaim public space. How can we create public spaces of social encounter to build this citizenship idea and well-being and convert them into a resource for every human and non-human being? When I talk about non-human being, I'm thinking about uh, nature. Uh, cities are <clears throat> the way they are because they have been like a process of transformation that has turned them into what they are. Before they were what they are now today, it was just empty spaces, but not empty uh, themselves. There, there was nature there. So we have to acknowledge that. And how we are able to support and contribute to the ecological balance or, uh, of our planet. So we try to move from a human-centered idea to a balanced idea of urban development. A balance in terms of uh, what's the relationship between the human being and the nature he lives in. So uh, a lot of people have been talking about care, especially during COVID. Um, a lot of researchers have talked and written about it. But I think that Arup, have, have you know about Arup? It's a big company that do a lot of things. They construct, uh, they build buildings, they do urban design projects, they do a lot of things. But they have this proximity of care um, guide, and you can search for it. It's free, it's free for access to all. Uh, and I think that it's important because they resume a lot of things that have been. Um, have been in practice over the year uh, in many um, urban projects. And they have this framework. The framework has um, dimensions, which are four, and it has scales. So they argue that care is related to the support given for kids. Uh, I'm going to mainly um, talk about uh, care related uh, to kids. So they, they talk about support in the home, in the neighborhood, and in the city. So they said, they said for, for instance, a kid can thrive, and the caring structures around him can be good if he has enough support from his parents in the, in the home. 
if he has uh, support from his neighborhoods, from the community he lives in, if he's able to play in the street, if, he, if he's able to walk to, um, to a school. And from the city, if there's, there are enough and sufficient uh, policies that support the, um, the growth of this kid. So if you have good education, if you have good health uh, facilities and a, a good health care system, you can say that the city is caring for the kids. And for others, but for, for the job that I have been doing during the years, I mainly uh, focus on, on kids. So you can search for it. And I'm not saying this is the base of, of our work, but it resumes a lot of things that we have been doing uh, over the years. So here we talk about urban landscapes of care, OK? So the concept has like three key ideas. The first one, the built space. I mean, the, the environment, the physical environment that surrounds us that has been mainly done by humans. The social space, the, the relationships we have and we build. No? If we build good relationships with others, we can say that those relationships are caring relationships. Because if you feel bad and you have a friend, let's say, he's going to be like asking, oh, hey, man, what's happening? Can I help? That's a caring um, behave, let's say. And then you have also a natural space. For over the years, there has been a discussion that the, the city has like two dimensions, um, the built environment and the social uh, tissue. But we think, and from Into Lab and the work we have been doing, that there's a third dimension related to the natural space, to how we can address uh, the landscape as a way to be in balance with the environment we live in. OK? So there's a difference between to care about and to care for something or for uh, somebody. And I'm going to quote uh, Milligan and Wiles. Um, they say, <clears throat> care is the provision of practical or emotional support. So I want, you invite, I want to invite you to think about one behave that you have had that can be related to care. Maybe, I don't know, um, asking a friend what he's doing, if he's feeling well, um, taking care of your kid, taking him to, to a school, talking with him, take him to a walk, um, to a park, let's say, play with him. Those are like caring behaviors. So landscapes of care are thus, thus a special manifestation of the interplay between the social structural processes and the structures that shape experiences and practices of care. So when I talk about these uh, caring behaviors, I'm talking about the behavior, but I'm also talking about the environment where the behavior occurs. So when we design, we, we need to think about those behaviors and which opportunities we are giving to the users of the spaces we are designing to behave in a caring way. OK? So there's a difference, as I said, to care for and to care about. Caring for is about the personal, the performance of proximate and personal care task, but it can also include the everyday tasks so, such as child minding, pet care, uh, as yesterday, Peter, or household tasks. And caring about, on the other hand, refers to the emotional aspects of care. This might also include the general, re generalized relation and the effective elements of being caring. So in IntuiLab, we use uh, some tools to, um, for, for our practice. And we use placemaking and tactical urbanism 
and I would say also guerrilla urbanism, as a way of caring for, for cities and for the communities we work, we work with. So these are two tools uh, and sometimes methods for experiences, experiencing and co-constructing the city and, and public spaces. We usually make the difference between placemaking and tactical urbanism because we think that placemaking has to deal with unstructured or informal um, situations that happen in the city instead of the, the built uh, stuff that, that remain in the place. So placemaking can be uh, understood as fairs, as festivals, concerts in the city, in the streets, uh, and tactical urbanism can be understood, understood as urban interventions uh, in a more like structured way. So we have uh, this uh, conception from uh, the project for public spaces. I suggest you to um, get around with it. It's, it's really interesting. And we always use this chart to evaluate how our projects are done and how we are making like, good places for people to, to stay. So we think that placemaking has also to deal to, with homemaking. It can be both um, pretty much close. It's a multidimensional process because it has to deal not only with the built environment, but also with the social structures that are um, in, that, in that environment. Uh, we prototype a lot of, uh, of projects to measure uh, the impact. Uh, you have to lower your expectations when you, th when you work in public spaces because you can design something that in your mind works really well and then you go there and it's a fail. And we think also from tempo temporary to permanent projects. As Christina said, the city, it's like an organism that it's constantly moving and transforming itself. So you have to think about temporary interventions that then can be transformed, enhanced, improved, to be uh, turned into permanent uh, projects. And also the collective appropriation of the, of the city. If, if a place is not used by the users, it's not working. So we have some examples of pop-up uh, bike lanes, international parking day, um, sorry, and this has been uh, occurring especially during COVID uh, situation. COVID, um, despite all the impact it has over humanity, served as uh, an opportunity for placemakers and urban designers to think about how the city can be adapted um, to, to this new situation we had and also to push uh, some caring or, or the caring uh, discourse uh, within the activities we, we did. Um, we also use participation as a tool and we like to think the participation as, um, like as, a, as a cycle that goes over and over and over again. Because as practitioners, we are outsiders. We come to a community, we see what's happening, we try to engage with people, and we come out with something. But that community remains, and that community is going to keep doing their own process and their own interventions on the space. You're not going to be there uh, forever unless you are, you are part of the, of the community. So participatory processes for um, new projects has their own stages, but these stages repeat and repeat and repeat over, over the years. And it's a, an ongoing process that has peaks, but has lower um, situations. Okay. So I have one case I want to point out, um, a case we work uh, also with, with um, the ISU. This was a park, that was the park that um, Ulrike was talking about. It had like some green areas you can see. 
So when we went there, we just keep going a process that was already um, started. So after ISU came, uh, other students from other universities came, and we uh, think about an urban plan for the, for the neighborhood, for, for Alto Peru, but also some interventions to like, try to get ideas from kids. And, and you, don't, you don't get kids over the table and ask them, hey, what do you want to do with your neighborhood? You try to engage with them with activities that are more related to what they like. So we kind of use the, the place, close the street to make a magical street uh, day. And from that, we got some ideas uh, for a new um, community center. And then we had some more structured uh, uh, meetings with, um, with neighborhoods there, with neighbors there. So we end up uh, having this architectural proposal that was really nice for the day. But then what happened? One night in a meeting, the community decided that the project was not going anymore. So that was a fail. We did the whole process. We thought we were doing well, but things happen. Communities are not like, um, they, they are not a common ground. There are some powers inside the communities that can push uh, decisions from, uh, to, to one, from one side to another. So what we are doing now, it's a, trying to transform the idea of the, um, of the project to a community center that's going to be somehow a mobile, that can be, as the restaurant that Christina said, moving over the city. The second case, and more related to uh, the urban landscapes of care and what Christina said about these small interventions, small situations that can uh, address how we build the, the informal city, are the projects that we did with the uh, municipality of Lima inside the Urban 95 project. Urban 95 is an initiative from the Bernard Van Leer Foundation that um, starts with a really simple idea and I want you to think about. And the question is, what would you do if you would experiment the city from 95 centimeters, which is the average height of uh, young children, of uh, three-year-old children? So with that in mind, we did uh, some projects using the framework of uh, landscapes of care uh, to think about which were the possibilities to improve the conditions of uh, urban spaces uh, for kids. So we did some activities to put them in contact with nature to see which were their reaction, if they like it of, of, or don't. And also to think about how we take care of each other and how we take care of the community, how we take care uh, of the nature we have on, on public spaces. And this is the result of one project. This, is, this was the before, sorry. This was the before situation. And this, this is now, the, the project is still there. Uh, it's located in the historical center of Lima. And that was the result of a participation process of eight months that drove us to that intervention that allowed us also to be in contact with kids and to help their families to have a better condition in the spaces um, they wanted to play. Um, when, we when we first came to this, to this neighborhood, we asked about children and they said, no, there's no children here. I mean, we have seen two or, th or three. So after we did uh, the project, a lot of children came uh, to play outside. So you have to be aware also that the community can, you, what you see is not what's real, okay? So there, there are some people that 
they can be shy or they can be kids that are inside their houses. So you don't have always a sense of the whole community and the powers inside it. We have this more related to the informal um, city. This is a place in, a place in Villa El Salvador, which was an assisted barriada. Um, and we re realized that there was a communal kitchen working here after COVID. They provided the whole community with food. So we tried to work with them and help them to think about the space and use a space that was um, empty and to think how the kids and how all the people can be in contact with nature as a way also to like heal all the scars that uh, COVID uh, left. So they have this place uh, that now is like more wildy, but they also have these, um, how do you call it, bio huertos? Oh, yeah, like, com like community gardens, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is also a, a caring infrastructure because the people who cook in the community kitchen could come here and get the food they need they need for the for for cooking, but also was a place for caring uh, childrens inside it. So you can see some childrens playing over there. This, this was also another intervention in San Juan de Lurigancho with the same um, idea, but with different shapes, as, as you may see. This is a communal house that has its own community mainly composed by uh, mothers who are organized and, and working there. And uh, we work with them to um, enhance the conditions of the, um, of the landscape. But you have also, as I said, tangible and intangible urban landscapes of care. So I showed you some tangible uh, landscapes of care where you can see some physical assets that can be used for, for caring. But in, within that the structure, you need like a social tissue that supports, supports the care. So along with the work we, we did transforming the public spaces, we also try to, I don't want to use the word empower, but it's like more close to what I'm trying to say, empower the people and the caregivers and the kids to be more aware of their environment and to be more aware of what are the possibilities or the potentials of caring about the environment and about the, um, the community. Um, so if we take care of our cities, they will take care of us. It's, um, it's like an ongoing, a relationship that we have to build. Um, after all this practical experience, we designed and published a Coursera course that you can enroll, it's free for, for all, that is called all Urban Landscapes of Care that has been produced by Intuilab with a collaboration of a UPC, Urban 95, the Bernard Van Leer Foundation, and financed by uh, TU Berlin. You can register here. Uh, if you look for social media uh, on Instagram, at Intuilab, you will find a link there also to enroll to, to the course. And uh, if you don't want to take a course, you can at least see the, um, the trailer and listen to a podcast that have been produced for the for the course. So some final reflections to leave you thinking about. Uh, our city is composed by material and immaterial elements, both of which demanded equal attention and are translated into activation and interventions promoted by a collective dream. When this when we think about this collective collective dream, we talk about which are the, the decisions that, that the community uh, take. We were talking with the uh, groups in the charrette that we had 
a lot of limitations here in the charrette because we don't have the community here, so we, don't, we cannot ask them what they want. But in a real life situation, you'll need to build this collective dream of what's going to happen then. It cannot be something that you come out and say, this is, this is what should be done. Urban landscapes are changing naturally or due to social dynamics seeking to recover or protect local values. So this intention of having a garden here was an intention to recover some, some place that has been taken by a project uh, for a road extension. So urban landscapes are an intention, urban landscapes of care are an intention to try to find this balance between the human and their activities, but also with the, with the nature. Temporary activations and interventions embedded in a participatory process help to imagine possible futures and test new activities and behaviors that can be generated in urban spaces. As you may have seen, um, our approach to participation, it's not only getting people into a table and think about the project, it's also a, a practical approach of occupying the, the street, thinking about it, thinking about the history of the street, taking children to play uh, and promoting activities that can be done um, in the place. And also, and one of the most important things that we have learned is that mutual respect is needed to create an atmosphere of care. We should reduce, and I'm always thinking about this, we should reduce the ego, the ego of the designer. We as designers are, are taught that we have the solutions. We know what, what's needed uh, over the place. But we really don't know. The people know also some things. So we have to try to um, put all the knowledge at the same level in a respectful way. And with that, try to build something better. Uh, than, than we have. So I think that was all. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, here you have the social media of Intuilab. Uh, you can follow our work. Um, we're working now in some more interesting projects that we can share um, later. Thank you. very much. Uh, Christina, sorry. <laughs> I was thinking about patience. Wait, friends, wait, friends. You are missing the surprise. Patience is up there. Thank you. Um, Jose and Christina, are there any questions, comments from the audience? Yes. And I have to run up, or you can come down. Or Christina, come to the front also, because there's the first question, yes. Okay, um, I have a question both to Jose and Christina. And you know, as uh, architects, as designers, we don't just uh, give our interventions in a vacuum. We're actually doing that in an ecosystem. And in this eco ecosystem, we have uh, politicians, right? And especially in the informal settlements, uh, allow me to call them slums, we have uh, people who benefit from uh, the crisis, especially in terms of resources and all that. If we solve uh, certain things like food security and water, as Christina talked about today, we take someone out of uh, you know benefiting from from the problem that is within that informal uh, settlement. So I just want to know some of the creative ways uh, that you've been able to you know factor uh, the politicians or politics as you give interventions in the informal settlements. Well, it's a tricky question because a lot of the things we've done were done also informally in terms of not really engaged with public administration, but for a couple of the projects Jose has shown. I mean, into his latest projects are much more involved with official political structures. But uh, having said that, 
It's a very complex negotiation, and I think it has to do with, in the case of Peru, because I don't know how, what, how things are run here, it has to do with sometimes corruption and politicians that don't really care about what's going on in terms of the city. So maybe um, I think that we have to learn to find ways in which everybody thinks they are winning. You know, uh, some of the informal settlements in Lima were established and consolidated and they got water and power because politicians were promising them that in exchange of votes. So that is not really clean in, you know, moral terms, but people got water and they got power and they got some sort of, you know, public transportation and whatnot. So maybe it's not the right way, but people got the everybody felt that they were winning. So if we, as architects or urban planners, uh, propose solutions in which everybody has the feeling that they are winning something, that maybe some of that can be navigated. But it's always a negotiation. It's always a struggle, and cities are complicated. Cities are super complex. So uh, it is better when we find allies in governmental forces, but that's not always possible. So another thing that can help a lot is uh, grassroots organizations, empowering populations, and sometimes even acting as catalysts for better decision-making in political terms. I mean, sometimes we don't go vote. Sometimes when we go vote, we're like, yeah, may, whatever. But uh, that, I don't know if this is part of being an architect or not, but maybe it's just part of being a citizen to try to be aware of, you know, our political role in everything. So I don't really have an answer. There's so, do you hear me? Mm, creo que está por yeah. There's, al there's always a political um, position. Either you vote or you don't, or you participate or no, or, or not participate. I wanted to point this graph because it shapes what's the participatory process for us, but it's also the political process of inhabiting a, a place. Sometimes you're up because your interests are well filled and you have good public spaces, you have good transportation and blah, 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 but sometimes not. And it's because just political willingness. So powers move, you know, and you, it's, it's difficult to control it. The only way we have for, uh, to, to our extent of knowledge, it's voting. But, well, here in, in the U.S., uh, voting is not mandatory. In Peru, it is, and some other countries also. Uh, but then you don't have much control of it. So as long as you participate or try to behave in an informal way but within the formal structures and try to get something out of it, it's going to be good, the, the things you do. You have to be aware also that there's negotiations, as, as Christina said, and, and you have to be um, aware that your interests may not be the ones that are get to the final decisions uh, sometimes. There's a question here in the front, Doug. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks very much, both of you, for those presentations and for, for coming here. Um, and I do have some like kind of cautionary or, or critical notes, but I wanted to preface those by saying these are not really kind of directed at you and certainly not at the particular projects that you've shown. But I do find there are some things disconcerting about framing what goes on in the city and architecture through this lens of care. Um, because I think it drastically oversimplifies things. If we just talk about the city and its architecture and its inhabitants in terms of who cares and who doesn't, and if that we all just get together and care, then that will address our problems, then that whitewashes what actually drives the development of the city, which is the, the competition between people who want to use the city as a space. 
<laughs> do you want to use the city as a, as a space to live in, to bring up their children, to in, enjoy, uh, and those forces who want to use the city to generate and increase real estate value? And the people who want to increase the real estate value nowadays use ex exactly the same language as you're using. So they talk about, we're going to create communities, we are going to make places, we are using festival, festivals to kind of appropriate things like public parks, um, we're going to be ecological, um, and we're, we're going to, to care. So those, that same discourse that you're using, as I said, I have no question over your personal intentions, but the same discourse is used and by practices like Arab to smooth and advertise the process of gentrification um, and the displacement of people in slum settlements. Um, and you can see that in places like Bangkok, where I, I spent some time with some activists there this summer. And then again and again, it's parks that are used, that are created to displace people and to raise the real estate value. Um, so I, I just wonder what, you know, your reflections on the way in which this discourse can be used and misused mm -hmm. might be. Mm -hmm. um, I may not have the exact words in English because sometimes English just go away, goes away. But I think that... Um, Every discourse and every theory that human beings create are just tools, and those tools can be used for the good and for the bad, or for whatever you can call good and bad. So what we were trying to, to do with our work, it's obviously do the good. And, but, but we acknowledge and we recognize that, let's say, the proximity of Kerr Guide done by a group which is a controversial uh, firm uh, can be used for really enhancing places where people live but also for gentrification uh, projects so it depends on who uses the tool you know it, it happens I mean uh, if you think about tech you can use AI for um, enhancing the production of something but you can also use AI for, I don't know, hack, hacking uh, systems to get data from people, you know? But AI, it's AI. It's just a tool. So for us, the, the approach uh, about care in, in, in the city, it's a, it's a tool and it's, a, it's an approach that serves us to be aware of what we are doing and to think about some philosophy we want to uh, promote around our, our work. I cannot talk about others, but I, I acknowledge that there are some uh, companies and some developers that are using the same discourse for doing things that we consider that are, that are not good. I would like to add to that that there is something that is missing and I don't know how to fix it is that something to add to the discussion and that is you know ethical regulations uh, regulations that prevent real estate to just go ahead and take it and gentrify it and uh, in that ex to, to that extent the Peruvian situation is particularly dramatic because a lot of decision makers and a lot of people who have, you know, a say, who are, have a seat on the table and have a say on what gets done and what doesn't are part of, you know, the real estate mechanism. So we as architects, I am going to repeat myself a bit, we got to get engaged into decision making and into policy making if we want some change to happen. Because as long as we are sitting on our, you know, tables and doing pretty pictures, uh, well, let's hope for a generous client to provide for the community, and that's, not, that's probably not going to happen. So we got to get our hands dirty. Question in the middle. Hello. So, yes, I have a question. So all your projects that you've done, 
uh, do you guys have a specific client that asked for it? And uh, you guys also uh, dealing with a lot of uh, children, so I would imagine there will be a lot more regulation that comes into it because you can just go to a park and be like, hey kids, what do you want to do, right? <laughs> and then also from your uh, public project uh, example from Jose's, um, so I know you got the example from Germany and it was from Next, and I know they were the client because I actually work with the uh, architects who built it, mm -hmm. so they came to us and have the complete idea of what they actually want to do with the space. So I just have that question. Thank you. Well, that's a tricky one. Thanks for it. Um, about the example, um, it's always tricky to see images because you interpret, you like, you get the ideas from it, from the background you have and what you think it's possible and what's good in your terms. So yeah, when we chose that image, we were thinking about which are the possibilities of, of a public space. We didn't know about the, um, the client and, and all the, the stuff that has been going um, behind the, the scenes. And it has to do to what, what he says. We, we don't know which are this, the discourses or which are the interests sometimes behind what we see. And we have to be crit really critical about, about that uh, sometimes, and, and, and we try to. It's difficult, but we try to. And talking about, what was the first? Uh, what the oh, clients. Oh, the clients, okay. So that's a, um, that question made one associate of us going out of into lab. Uh, because when we started the collaboration with ISU, we thought, okay, we're working with communities, but who's paying for that? And the ISU, with funding, I mean, not, I'm not saying that they paid uh, for it, but they arranged a funding, uh, a crowdfunding to, to allow things uh, to happen. But the final user of those interventions were the community, but they were not paying us. So what that, when that happens, it's really challenging because it puts you in a situation of you have to comply to some requirements, and also you have to be aware of not damaging the community. So as I said, uh, Intuilab tries to link the academia with uh, real life situations. And the main challenge we have while doing our work is complying with both, um, with both sides. You know, we are like a bridge between academia and communities, but we don't want we don't want to like be bad to them. Okay, so it's always a negotiation between what we can do, what 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 we cannot, how we fund ourselves, and. I won't say there's a client because a client um, puts you on a capital-based situation that you receive money for giving some services. And we prefer to think that we are funded to start some processes that has a lot of stakeholders related to the process. And we are always trying to find something better for, for the communities we work with. So we, we establish like a more horizontal relationship between the, the stakeholders where no knowledge is better of above uh, other. We are all the same with different approaches, with different interests, but we are always related to a process that can lead us to something better. question and then I think we can take the conversation outside because I think Carlos is waiting with some tacos, right? <laughs> okay. There's a limited amount. We only have uh, 100 meal tickets and I have well, the, the golden tickets. So I don't think we are more than 100 people. Uh, well, <laughs> he, in order to eat tacos, you need one of these. So I'll hand them out Perfect. to the door. Great, yeah. <laughs> so Smita, your question. Hi, so my question is more direct. So I, I didn't saw anything related to the maintenance of this of those projects that you showed. So I, uh, whatever community project I saw in the past, uh, they later on got ruined due to the 
maintenance lacking so mm -hmm. who is in charge of those maintenance of the projects and you were also mentioning that uh, the funding mainly comes from some other external organizations so did you ever try even for uh, funding from the community who are in charge of those projects like who are enjoying those facilities okay so there are two questions over there right um, talking about the funding from communities um, we haven't usually done that, but when we find that there's a strong community, they usually um, get organized to get some funding. So they organize these parties called polladas, which is like chicken, chicken parties. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. And they do some community activities where they sell some food or make a festival or a concert, and they like crowdfund on their way. That, that had happened, but I won't say that's like the main resource for funding uh, to communities because they, usually the things that we address with them, it's um, then like not prior, prioritized, you know, in terms that you first take care of your home, of your household, and then of your community. So they are more willing to be aware of what's happening uh, from their door inside instead of, of outside. So when we work with community, and that links me to, to the other question, uh, we work with communities that are, uh, how, how would be the word, is strong enough to take the endeavor of a, of a process of transforming a, a space. We have failed. I mean, I'm not including all the fails that we had, uh, but I remember the first project with it with ISU was a, a library. And after four or five months, the library was shut down. The books were all in uh, storage because uh, someone was uh, thinking that they were going to steal them. And the library is not there anymore. I mean, the structure is, but it's not being used as a library anymore. Uh -huh. And that's because we got there thinking that we had the answers and we weren't asking the right questions. So that's uh -huh. why we are pestering you guys about asking the right questions because uh -huh. we know that's part of it. And, and something that works, and just, just to finish, yeah. is that you always need a champion. We call them in, in, in the work we have done a champion. It's like this, this community leader that it's always there and it's caring for the place, and it's pushing others to care, to care for the place. I mean, we, if, uh, here, I don't have a picture of her, but we have Charo. Here we have Charo. Charo is uh, it's a, neighborhood, a neighbor who lives there and who's always taking care of the, of the place. Uh, here we have uh, David, which is another guy that's always looking for the place. And when we have worked with some organizations, they are the ones who take care of the, of the place. In Alto Peru, in Chorrillos, Alto Peru, it's an NGO that works there uh, based on surfing and using surfing also for, for development, and they take care of the, of the place. We, are, we recognize that we are outsiders, so we're not going to be there always. So there's always the need of someone that it's going to continue the process of the community and also the process of taking care of the place. Well, um, I think we can thank Christina and Jose again for their presentations. <laughs> and Peter is going to take you out for some food and continue the conversation with Jose. I have to snatch... Patience will help us. There's the real patience. <laughs> Thank you, guys.